Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 341, uh, featuring Rudy McNeil, who goes by Rue. Uh, and he is a 3D modeler over at MPC uh, currently, and he's doing some pretty interesting things. This was an introduction to us through, uh, through Henry, actually. I think Henry met him over at uh, Vertex and said, you know, you got to talk to this guy. He's pretty entertaining and he's got some really great advice and some feelings. And I thought he was great. It was a lot of fun to talk to him. Yeah. Uh, first time I ever met him uh, and uh, really cool. So Kristen, what did you think of, uh, of Rue? Well, he came in with a, a good punch <laughs> that his first movie was Thor Ragnarok, which is like right. one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Um, and I also liked how he said he started learning 3D modeling in school and found out just doing it online was faster and cheaper and he got still got a great education. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he's worked on Wonder Woman. Um, mm -hmm too uh and then he also <laughs> gave uh good advice on like some different routes you can do as an artist just like if you're in it for the money or if you're in it for just to make some beautiful art so mm -hmm. i like thought that was interesting um and then he said uh how him and his friends uh they did like working sometimes on the lowest rotten tomato scored movies and um, because they just try to make it better and it was just that was a cute little piece that they did so <laughs> yeah it was yeah. pretty cool it was also he also gave a really good little story uh about how you how recruiting kind of happens in the uk as well and you know mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting and how you the best place to get your next job is actually to go to the pub of the company <laughs> that you yeah. want to do so so that was kind of an interesting thing yeah the, he was uh Ru's definitely a really cool guy uh really interesting to talk to him so i thought it was it was a lot of fun for sure all right now uh we have a couple of announcements this week coming out this week you guys can be part of 24 hours of chaos tell people more about that Kristen. All right, so Thursday on September 9th, uh, 24 Hours of Chaos starts, and it will go all the way uh, through Friday, September 10th. Um, it's going to be 12 back-to-back -back shows with more than 60 hosts, speakers, and guests, all on 24-hour live stream. And if you want to find more about this, it's at chaos.com slash 24 hours. Um, and hours is spelled out H-O-U-R-S. So it'll Perfect. be really fun. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, and in, in fact, you can find all of our events over at chaosgroup.com slash events. We have something else happening on the 23rd. What's going on then? Yes. So on September 23rd, we have a V-Ray 5 for Rhino webinar, and you'll get to learn tips for a quick and easy architectural workflow. Perfect. And we have, uh, as far as our product announcements, V-Ray 5 for Unreal is out, which is great. I actually have been using it extensively recently, uh, and it's a lot of fun to figure out what we can do with that. So go check it out at chaosgroup.com. Now, if people want to know more about the podcast, where can they go? You can go to facebook.com slash podcast or chaos.com slash cggarage. And if you would like to watch us, go to youtube.com slash chaosgrouptv. Perfect. And if you guys uh, want to know more, uh, have any ideas for the podcast or ideas that, or, or comments about this one or questions, don't forget to just email us labs at chaosgroup.com. Uh, all right. But that being said, please enjoy this awesome podcast with Rudy McNeil. Welcome to another CG Garage where the Chaos Group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. This is gonna be an interesting podcast because I don't, I usually know someone who I'm talking to and I've never met okay. you before. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm going by Henry's recommendation of having you on and Henry never has let me down in terms of interesting people to meet. So uh, I'm really glad we we're able to, to do this. Uh, and, you know, just the fact that you have a Nick Offerman behind you <laughs> and uh, that uh, you go by, first of all, you go by Rue. Yeah. So the, the full one's Ruari, but it's just because um, I work with a lot of international people, Ru's a whole right. lot easier. Ru's easier. But the Rory, I actually know a Rory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do know a spelled slightly, it doesn't have the extra two letters that you have at the end of yours. Now, yep. so your Rory is what, you're from Scotland, I'm assuming? Yeah, so that's north of Scotland, but they're again, right. like different bits of Scotland spell it differently. Right. It's, it's always a fun one. 
But Rory, I know, is actually Irish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's Gaelic. So there's Gaelic Scottish and Gaelic Irish. They're super right. close, but like just different enough to cause a problem. Yep. And I had a good friend of mine uh, when I worked at Digital Domain uh, who was also very Scottish. His name was Rory McLeish, which is a very good Scottish name. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I was uh, very good friends with him, and he was an excellent uh, modeler and lighter. Uh, and I had a great time uh, working with him. So I do have an affinity for some amazing Scots and the industry, and Good. I'm excited <laughs> to talk to you about it. Uh, and I'm a big fan of uh, Scotch whiskey. So uh, <laughs> also yeah. a good thing. You can't go so, wrong there. <laughs> you can't. No, I can't. Uh, so I'm. I, that, but basically, that's that's the thing, right? I, I, I only know two things about you, uh, three things. I know that uh, that uh, uh, Henry said you're an, uh, an awesome and fun person to be with, as I'm sure you are. Uh, I've seen your reel on ArtStation of the stuff okay. you've done. Uh, some A lot of great environment work and modeling work I'm, uh, is what I, uh, I got, especially from uh, Thor uh, Ragnarok, which I absolutely mm. loved. Um, and, uh, and I know that you have a Scottish name. So besides that... <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about your origin story so that I can get to know a little bit more what's uh, what goes on behind you? <laughs> sure. Um, so modeling for films is my, my whole main thing. Um, yeah. It's, it's How did you get into I, that? <laughs> that's um, that's something I've just wanted to do since forever, but it was when I was, well, I don't even know what age I was. It was when I was learning, um, I think I was still learning how computers properly worked at that point in time. It was one of my mum's friends um, came with uh, one of those like CDs that used to come free in a magazine with like a trial of light wave. Uh -huh. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And it had like a four week course on how to build a sandcastle that now looking back on it, it's like four minutes work. But then it took me forever and it was like, you know, build a cylinder, extrude, extrude the things on the top, done. But that took forever then and it just blew my mind. I was like, I can build sandcastles and I don't have to persuade my mum to take me to the beach. I was like, yep, yeah, this works for me. <laughs> I just kind of started following it from then. It just, I, it just kind of clicked with me. So I've yeah. been teaching myself pretty much ever since then. It was Lightwave, and then I moved into Modo because it's kind of a natural, natural move over. Um, right. Which, which is now fun because everybody I work with uses Maya, and I have really no clue how Maya works. That's that's, that's quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. You still use Modo today? Yeah. So I, I use. I have to use Maya at work for pipeline stuff, but I do all my modeling work in modo nice and all my render so it's just yeah i pretty much just spent a good few years teaching myself running around kind of smaller companies doing like tv adverts and stuff like that um was in poland for a while working for a company making 3d furniture I still don't entirely know how i got that job or how that whole thing happened and then it was i think over the course of like two weeks i had a, an email from frame store like do you want to come work for us and i was like yep yeah, bye poland and then like okay. two weeks later, I was suddenly I was working in films for the first time, and I've just been at it ever since then. Well, that seems very fast. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a quick turnaround. Okay. If you ever want a if you ever want a challenge, try and move a rabbit to a different country in two weeks. That's oh. more challenging than anything I've ever done before. You have to get yep. little passports and stuff. It's crazy. You had a pet rabbit. You had to move to Poland. <laughs> No, from from Poland to London. Oh yeah, well, any animal that goes into London, it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was that was more difficult than anything else. Like they, they starting a whole new career in film, that wasn't so bad compared to moving this rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, did you have to go into quarantine? Because they usually do some long quarantine sometimes. No, there's a, it was like a specialist service for specifically for taking animals from uh, Warsaw. To London, I, I guess there's enough people do it that a business is formed around it. It's just, I don't know if it was entirely legal, but it, it okay. was pretty easy. <laughs> okay, well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Okay, well that's interesting. Uh, all right, so you so you moved to London and you started work at Framestore. What was the first film you worked on? That was Thor Ragnarok was my first one there. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that was yeah, that was quite a deep end start. That one. It was. Kind of came in, didn't entirely know what we we're doing. Like, oh, we're just going to build pretty much all of uh, the, the first task was building like Odin's Tower and all the the Rainbow Bridge. It's like, oh, like the two biggest things in the world. Okay, <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it was. It was, it was. I think it was probably one of the best films to start on. Is uh, Taika Waititi directing it? He's also a character in it, so he was super, super into the VFX. So it wasn't 
so much like a clinical brief of like it needs to be this concept art and there can be no deviation from it. It was pretty much like this is what I've got in mind. Like I know you guys have got like cool ways to do it. Like show me what you can do. There's a lot of freedom to just kind of go mad. That yeah. Was, yeah. That was fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh well that's really cool. Uh I I yeah, I my my first film was actually Day After Tomorrow. So and it was Ooh. a similar similar thing where they're like we have to build all of New York. <laughs> Good <Yeah. luck. laughs> so uh so yeah and my background was architecture. So I uh, they said, "Oh, good, you're an architect. You know how to build buildings. Do it." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does it does it transfer well architecture into like VFX buildings? Is it a similar way of doing it or that's an interesting question. Uh, I think uh, yes and no. Uh, in, in architecture, you worry about precision for construction. <laughs> and in yeah. visual effects, you worry about precision for how many pixels it takes up on the screen. Yeah. So uh, sometimes you overbuild when you're modeling as an architect, <laughs> which I learned. Okay, yeah. I can imagine that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, uh, I did, I modeled, you know, similar to you, a very uh, interesting story. Like I had to build, a, you know, the, the Hollywood sign that gets destroyed for all the, the Ooh, that's a cool build and, but it's really simple <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's all, that's all it's super simple but i said no oh, i put all the rivets in there and <laughs> every little piece and uh and uh yeah so it was a little overdone i came they kept laughing at me because i built it really quickly but i went o way overbuilt and they were like you know yeah. it's gonna be like this big on the screen it's like okay <laughs> yeah but it's, it's the pride thing <laughs> yeah, it is the pride thing that's true yeah. So what 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 got you into to modeling? Like you said, you were like, you know, I can build sandcastles, but now I can do them on a computer, and I don't have to bother my mother to go to the beach. So yeah. what uh, what what made you want to, uh, you know, model? Like, what is what is attractive to you about modeling? Do you have like a secret architect gene inside that you hasn't awoken, or? Um pretty much just just down to binge watching that how it's made TV show. I don't know if they still make that or not. Um, uh -huh. but I just used to love watching that thing. It was like you know, like you see, like a like a, like a bottle of cola or something. It's just like a random object you don't really think about, and then you see this like huge plant that's all built and all these little intricate machines that kind of oh. like extrude and form and stuff. And it's like that's super cool. And then yeah. I got really interested, in, like thinking about how stuff's actually made. And then I kind of started becoming aware, like I could get a job like doing that. It's like. Yeah, that, that quite works for me. But I was a wee bit too lazy to go the actual mechanical side of building the things. Uh -huh. And it became a, it's something I became aware of as well. Like, if you go down that route, it can be quite a narrow path of, like, I could be, like, an excellent engineer for, like, this one machine. But, I no, I'm not going to have a lot of, like, room to do other stuff. And then looking at, like, modeling, is like, I can kind of do all of that. But I can, depending on the film or whatever I'm working on, it'll be a completely different challenge, a completely different process. And, like, yeah, that's... Kind of gives me a chance to do what I really want to do, but enough breakup that I hopefully shouldn't get bored. That's kind of the idea. Right. And you're not restricted by, you know, pesky things like physics and... <laughs> yeah, I can just, like, like I can change... I can change a slider and suddenly gravity is different. It's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I had a similar thing and, you know, in architecture, I was like, I don't actually care if they build the building. <laughs> 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 I think it's okay. If if I just make it in the computer and everyone looks at it and it's cool, you know, and it's fun and I'm, I appreciate it. So, uh, yeah. It's good as well. There's a certain like removal from responsibility as well. If something goes wrong, it wasn't me. I just made it on the computer. I didn't build it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's true. I mean, is that something you think you're going to continue to do? Or are you interest, interested in, 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 in mostly doing like hard surface modeling or things of that nature? Or are you interested in character modeling and all the other things as well? Let's kind of an interest when I'm starting a hopefully a bit of a transition at the moment um because I'm at NPC just now but in the character lab um and you know, all my skills are hard surface based so this is a completely new world to me like I've got a, a rough understanding of how to go about making characters but mm -hmm. it's very much like a like a student level knowledge versus I'm surrounded by like incredible professionals I'm very much out of my depth but it's just kind of the way I like to do stuff is like um I, I don't like a timid approach. It's kind of like just put yourself into the deep end and you'll very quickly find out within like a month or two if it's going to work or not. Yeah. I, it's, I've got like a lot of friends. I know that um, from... So I I kind of went to uni for like two months and then I, it was like my first time away from home and pubs and clubs became much more interesting. And fortunately, <laughs> it was like 3D modeling. Like you can learn online. 
it's not I mean it's much better to go to university but fortunately it was like a backup option but I've got a few friends that stuck out the whole four year course and I think they, they were doing it just for the posterity of finishing it and by the end of it they had no interest in like 3D thing and they'd taken like four years like you know if you just if you tried it really like if you tried hardcore for like a month you would have realized instantly like this isn't for me Right. That's kind of the way I like to approach it. I can just find it quickly before I waste a business's time or my own time. Um, but like, I think character work is uh, it's going to become a bit of a necessity, especially if you're in London, because uh, there's a I think it's like Canada and India. A lot of um, a lot of like really really good studios are opening up there. A lot of hard surface work, and I think especially just now with um, like post COVIDy goodness. A lot yeah. of people don't want to have a massive office if we can all work from home. So, like, why not outsource it somewhere? It really doesn't matter where you're based if you can outsource. So, and like, if I'm going to stay in London, which according to my rent contract, I've still got a while I need to be here. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to need to learn characters. Okay. Okay, that's an interesting. Part. All right, you brought up you brought up a lot in the, the what you were just mm -hmm. talking about. So let's talk a little break that down a little bit first. Keep in mind, I, I, I know a lot about this stuff, but now some of our listeners may be interested in hearing other people's influence on this. Tell me your your take on the difference in terms of challenges, et cetera, between uh, doing hard surface modeling, uh, what hard surface modeling means to you, and then character modeling. Like, What are the big differences that, you're, that you, you notice in those two things? Uh, hard surface modeling... If you're just getting into modeling, if you want like a start and your main goal is to just quickly get up and running and getting paid, it's much easier because you can hide and fake a lot of stuff. You know, if you look at like a product, it doesn't matter if it's got a bit of a dent or a ding, you can get away with a lot. Whereas like a character modeling with that whole uncanny valley, you can look at a character and even if you're not an artist, you can immediately go like, that's weird looking. There's something wrong with the eye or like the skin's not right. There's so many foibles. Like you need to spend months and months and months on like a single eyelash to get it perfect. Whereas if it's something hard surface, you can just kit bash a bunch of stuff together, get it out the door, it's good. And nobody's going to really question it because like, yeah, it's a spaceship. Of course, it doesn't look like something I recognize because we don't live in space. It's just, right. And I think it's the easiest path into learning. But the character modeling is definitely much harder because it's you're not just thinking about the way it looks, you've got to think about like internal structure, you know, like, um, skeleton and muscles. There's a lot more going on that you don't see. And I think that's the bit that really catches a lot of juniors out is the immediate want that really cool shot on their art station of like a character. Like, yeah, that's probably really cool from that one angle that you've rendered it out and that one lighting setup, but like, can it animate? Like as soon as the eye moves, everything falls apart and creases and destroyed. It's like, mm -hmm. I think that stuff it just it takes so long to learn. It's just it was it was pretty much like a an aspect of I need to hurry up and make some money. Hard surface is a quick way to do this. And then right. I just got my my workflow really, really good at it and it's now kind of become my specialty. Right. But it's, the characters uh, are hard. Yeah. So that's interesting. Okay. I they're de they're definitely hard. Uh uh and uh as opposed to hard surface. Well, stuff, <laughs> but uh, they, uh, but there's things I'm sure like you must have, you know, there's certain things that you're learning, uh, probably through this process, right? You're probably learning, um, uh, what it means, what anatomy is, for example. Yes. So that's a skill set that is all of a sudden like, oh, now I know what a clavicle is. <laughs> <laughs> I think a huge part as well is that it's much harder, I found in general, to get good human or animal type reference. Um, like if I'm if I'm texture painting something, like if I if I wanted to make a like a, a VFX model of like my favorite celebrity or something, um, how am I going to get photos of the same color space and the same lighting from different angles that I can use to texture it? Like it's really hard to gather a lot of that information up accurately. Uh, right. I think that's like that's one of the bits I found the hardest is I don't know where to go and get that kind of reference without hiring like a studio to do a head scan that I cannot afford to get done. I don't know how to go about doing that. Right. Well, that's hard, right? I mean, do you have did did you buy a bunch of anatomy books and start looking at those things as well, or? 
Um, it's the is it ten twenty four? I believe the I think that's the, the the main company, but they've got I think it's three D scan store. Um, uh-huh. I pretty much just bought a bunch of. Uh, I started off. They've got a couple of free references just to give you like a, a foot in the door understanding of how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also, as well as the models, they sell photo sets. So that was kind of how I I started to look into the character side of things. But I think it's that initial. It's that initial thing of like when you're a student or like a junior or just getting into like the prospect of having to pay fifty pound for some reference photos. It's like why would I do that when I can just go on a Google for free? Like, yeah, you can go on a Google for free, but you're not going to get the quality you need. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It is a very difficult thing, and also you need con- you need context to what you're looking at, right? Yes. So you need someone to tell you this is what this is and this is why this looks the way it does. Just because you have a picture of it doesn't mean you understand why something looks the way it does, right? Yes. I think that's one as well, like dailies. Like if you've if you're if you've never been to a dailies before, I don't know where you'd find that experience. You could probably set up like a, a temporary one with some friends or something. But like I think that's the most useful thing that happens when you start actually working versus learning is sitting in a room full of people who are not related to you, who are not your friends, who don't care about your feelings, and they just sit there and with like a laser pointer and just like they tear your soul apart the first time you meet them. But then like your work becomes so much better. Right. If you're just sitting at home, you know, you'll go like, hey, mom, does this look cool? She's like, wow, that's amazing. Okay, I put it online then. It's like, no, that's not the right person to ask. You're always going to get that positive answer. Right. 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 Absolutely. You know, there's a guy who's in London who I know is a friend of mine, uh, and he is like an expert in anatomy and teaches a lot of classes mm. to people who are learning that stuff. His name is Scott Eaton. Uh, and he's yeah, done I know a, the name. Yeah. He's done a ton of that stuff. So he's a great resource, uh, to, to hit up on that stuff. But yeah, so, so, so character stuff is, is hard. Uncanny Valley is definitely something Oh, yeah. I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah. uh, I started a I started a project uh, many years ago called the WikiHuman Project, so I'm well aware of the the challenges between those things. But you mentioned earlier, it's interesting uh, that you feel that a lot of the hard surface modeling is going to go by the wayside. Is that yeah? Okay. I mean, it's it's already gone by the wayside. Like, um, it's not so much to do with kind of. But it initially started as geography. But I think that was more of like a political uproar from the community mm-hmm. more than anything else. It's just more to do with basics of technology, you know, like um the way like the way you built that building when you were working for like the Hollywood sign and stuff. The way you built mm-hmm. that then, it's not the way you build that now. You're probably mm-hmm. going to like Houdini, connect four nodes together, it procedurally done, <laughs> and that's it. You could have like one person could build an entire city in like a week. You don't need a whole team because the tools are just completely different. Yep. I think, so like a lot of hard surface stuff, you unless it's like a hero asset, if it's environments, it's going to be a lot of procedural automated work and there's so much recycling. I think that's, that's one that I've, I've caught a lot of people off guard. Like they think like you build everything from scratch every time. Like, you no, know, if we can get it on turbo squid for like 20 pound and then I just like fix the topology a bit, that costs less than me working on it for a week. So yep, yeah, let's do that. And then that same car will get used because I know like Pixar do it as kind of like a like a little joke. You know, in the films you can find like the pizza van or you can find like a Buzz Lightyear. They're always hiding somewhere. They kind of do right. it as like a fun thing, but that's pretty much every film ever. If they've got one really good car, they're just going to keep using that same car in all the different films because why waste time building it again? Right. You know, well, that's interesting because all right. Well, let's let's bring up the the, the Turbo Squid or the you know any of the other. There's many many stores. But Turbo Squid is obviously a well-known yeah. one. Uh, but what does that what does that mean? I mean, that means that okay, you don't have to model as much, but someone modeled it. <laughs> sure, it got yeah. recycled a bunch of times, but someone someone modeled it and put it up on Turbo Squid. Is that a resource that you know people can start to use? Like, if you like modeling, instead of actually working on movies, just make a bunch of stuff and put them on Turbo Squid. <laughs> I think it's going to depend on your goal. But for me, right. um, it's. It's pretty narcissistic, but I, I kind of love that bit at the end of a film when I've made my friends sit for like an extra 20 minutes for the end of the credits and you go, look, my name for like four seconds. Like, yeah, I win. Mm, it's right. just that, that little bit of vanity. But then that's it. I'm done. I never have access to that stuff again. I've been paid for the job. I no longer get paid. No matter how many times that film's played over and over again, I never get paid again for it. I've done the work. Right. So like if you're going for recognition or stuff like that, films is a great way to go. Turbo Squid is not a great way to go. 
Right. But if you're looking at this from like an income point of view, like it's that same thing. I make that one job, but then it's going to keep getting bought over and over again. I'm going to continue to make money every time somebody buys it. So mm-hmm. it's like, I mean, if you're in it for money, which I don't think art's really a place to go if you're in it for money. I mean, it's kind of, I think it's like old school style. Of, I mean, there's definitely a market for it, but I don't think it's something a lot of people get into purely for financial gain because it takes a long time to be able to make good money a lot of the time from doing artistic stuff. Um, but I, I well, think Turbo Squid's... Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you, you get pleasure out of what you're doing, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're if, happy... If it wasn't you're pleasure, happy. I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> yeah. Turbo Squid is not necessarily a place to get a lot of pleasure. Uh, I mean, no. it's a good resource. And, and it's definitely useful because people use your stuff and, and then you can say, hey, I recognize that car. I think I modeled it. They probably bought it on Turbo Squid. <laughs> it, I think it's like, I don't use it too much, but it also, it can force you to be a better personal artist because I've got stuff up for sale on there from personal projects. And because it has very specific rules, like they've all got their different rules, but they're all quite similar, like how the topology has to be, what kind of texture maps you've got, what's the size and everything. Like you have mm-hmm. to model to a specification. You can't just do it good enough for your own personal project. So like if you kind of model with that in mind, like if I, if I make a big project, if there's like some screws or something cool in there, I'll take them out and put them on TurboScoot just because I've already made them. I might make nothing on TurboScoot. I might make five pound over the course of my entire life. But who knows? But like, right. if I've, it just it kind of forces you to at least do it properly. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I think that's a good idea, and I think you know if that's that's some good advice for someone who wants to get into modeling. It's like, yeah, start trying to make stuff for Turbo Squid because you'll learn not yeah. just how to model, but how to make sure it's properly posted and and, and yeah. clean. I don't know. I've done it for a while, but it used to be you uploaded it, and then it would just like turn red and go like, nope not compatible You're like oh okay and then right. you have to go back and fix it it's yeah. i quite like that well that's cool so okay so you're at mpc now uh yeah. and you started working did you immediately go into the character work or did you start to, did they sort of put you in there at some point or did you decide uh, uh, asked to be in there well this is a, 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 a um for mpc at the moment it's the character lab mostly in london um, and a lot of their other work's getting done out in Canada and their India offices. Mm-hmm. So where I'm at at the moment is pretty much just character work and uh, their advertising department. Like their what is the lab film. part of? What is the lab part of it? <laughs> I think they just do a lot of development stuff. I'm, I'm fairly, I'm still fairly new to the company, so I'm still kind of getting getting on my feet with it all. But uh-huh. it's um, yeah, it's it's a hard it's a hard place to get a job in, but like if you want to become a character artist, I think like like NPC are up there the best at the moment. Like with I say like with Weta and like Digital Domain as well, they've been pretty good at characters. Right. It was I think it was from watching um like Blade Runner twenty forty nine when they brought mm-hmm. Rachel back from like you know they brought her back to her youthful state. And I was watching, mm-hmm. I was just like, that's just mind blowing. I was watching like the side by side comparisons like. If I'm going to learn characters, like this is probably the place I should try and get to. And, right. I mean, it was two streets down from the company I was currently working at. So, like, yeah, that's a pretty handy move. <laughs> right. Good. Well, yeah, you guys are all hanging out in Soho, right? That's the big... yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so, the only reason you pay the rent here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How is how is that? I mean, obviously. Okay. Well, that's that's interesting. You mentioned, you know. You mentioned COVID uh, and how you know that's influencing where people are living and what they're doing. How when was the last time you were actually able to go into the office? I was in there today. Oh, um, okay, but that's this is a pretty recent development. Um, I think for the first three or maybe three and a half months of working for them, I couldn't go to the office. It just it wasn't an option. So mm-hmm. It was quite quite weird. Like everything. Like I I joined a company. I met nobody. I was just still sick in my bedroom. So it was kind of like a weird feeling. It didn't really feel like I had a job. It's just, you know, I'm still sitting in the same place. I've met nobody new. I've not gone anywhere new. I'm sitting at the same desk. It was kind of, that was an odd thing to get your head around. Um, so it is, like, it is nice being back in the office, but I kind of got used to, like, the comforts of home. So at the moment, we're in, like, a hybrid model. So you're kind of half and half in and out, um, mm-hmm. for, like, a collaboration process. Because it is nice to be able to go into a room and, you know, just point to stuff and touch the screen and show stuff is. There's nothing more infuriating than trying to explain like a rendered or something or point a specific bit. 
the people who are in different time zones there's like a slight delay one person starts speaking and then it cuts out and then one person is like, ah just meet yeah. in a room real time but yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 interesting going back to it. it's um it's, it's been kind of fun watching like everybody trying to remember how to socialize it's been because like you know, remember i think 3d artists as a whole are not the most social people on the planet because we just put our headphones on for eight hours and then you maybe say hello and goodbye but it's kind of like watching people try to remember how to interact with each other and like how to ask questions it's it makes it kind of interesting it makes it worth the travel i i i i noticed the same thing i i went out to lunch with a couple of people you know went lunch outside and I hadn't seen them forever. You know, this is kind of a quote unquote business lunch where we were talking about stuff. And I realized like, I don't, I, I used to go business lunches three to four times a week. Yeah. And now I'm like, <laughs> I just, I was having a hard, hard time commuting. Like emotionally it was strange, you know? Yeah. There's, <laughs> it's a strange experience being isolated for so long and understanding what that means. So yeah, I, I completely know what you mean. Um, and socializing with people is tough. And then the, the you know, you keep talking about the particular pandemic instead of like just yeah. focusing on, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I just think, I think as well, like, I, I don't think people realize how important it is to socialize in VFX thing because it's, it's completely different from like a normal job. Um, I, I'll talk from the film point. I've worked for games as well. I know it's kind of different, but it's similar. Um, for the like, film point of view, like a lot of the times, like you know, it's like a three, four month contract. You don't, you don't have a safe job. You, you've got to pay rent for a year, but maybe you've only got a contract for three months. So like the other, you know, the other nine months, you're like, what am I going to do? And it's so important. Like if you make friends, um, I don't know, like a hiring manager or something, or like a production person, they'll maybe suggest you for a job. Or that's like everybody I've always met. I'm like, I take them to the pub on a Friday, like, whether they drink whether they don't it doesn't matter and like you're coming to the pub because everybody's at the pub you'll speak to everybody you'll speak to the people that you would never see in the building you know like hr is always in some corner miles away from where the artists are you never interact with them it's like we're going to the pub you're going to meet hr you're going to make friends with hr and then hopefully in three months time they'll give you another three month contract it's true it's, yeah it's absolutely true and especially I'm, I'm i'm assuming and you would know better than anyone but i'm assuming that in london in soho that the the pub has a lot of different studios going at the same time, right? Or is well, it like one pub per studio? <laughs> it's kind there's kind of like a one pub per studio. Huh. So it's it can be kind of interesting. You can tell if somebody's interested in like a new job. So like it used to be um as a green man used to be frame store's old pub. They've moved buildings since. So right. like it was just all frame store in the green man. And then you would maybe see like a couple of artists that you do work at NBC were suddenly hanging around the pub and like, ah, you're looking oh, you're to looking move company, new... I see. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a good way to get a feel. You can tell like as well if like a film's coming to an end or like sometimes the studios don't say what projects are on or not. If suddenly mm -hmm. like 15 people appear at the pub, you're like, okay, so something just finished at the studio. Mm -hmm. so you can tell when everybody's suddenly looking for a new gig. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I can imagine that that uh, that's a good way to uh, to recruit people, and, and <laughs> it's right there in the pub, right? I think it's the easiest way as well. If you've never worked in a studio, just hanging around people, you'll hear stories. Like you, you don't hear about like secret stuff about films, but you get to hear right. about company culture and like processes and what people think and stuff. And it's I think it's quite humanizing because you, know, you always see like an artist and like art station or one of these kind of places. Like wow, their art is incredible, but you don't really think of them as a human being. You think of them as like some person who does incredible stuff that you wish one day you could do. And then you just hang out at the pub and you're like, yeah, that took me four years to do. And I had to study this and I had, was like, researching every day. And like, you yeah. don't, it, it kind of gives you that option to see like, okay, they're not this like infallible creature. It's like, they're just the same as you. Just they focused on that particular thing for a bit longer than maybe you did. And that's the only reason it was better. And, and, and kind of encourage you to like, ah, oh, I can do the same thing then. It makes it yeah. a bit more accessible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I bet. I bet. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff to learn, especially when you talk to people about their experiences and how they did things. Uh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so what is your, I mean, what's your feeling overall about, you know, the state of the industry right now? Like how, you know, you've been in for a little bit. You've, you obviously have observed some interesting things like how to get hired at a pub. <laughs> uh, but what is your overall? overall feeling of the industry and how things are changing obviously in some ways um 
I think as a it's like it's a horrible time at the moment if you're an established artist with nowhere to go. Um, but it's like this it's like a bizarre juxtaposition. There are so many positions available at the moment, but because of like the nature of how they're hiring people, it's a really good time to be like a junior because it's kind of like they just need bums in the seats at the moment. They just need a lot of people to get in and do a lot of work because like the world stopped, you know, kind of moving for a year. But like mm-hmm. everybody still watched Netflix and Prime and everything. Content was still being consumed. So there's a huge backlog of work. So like there's there's a massive draw at the moment just to get people in to just to get a lot of the work out. Like the um, like for for stuff you're working on, you know, if you, maybe if you previs a, mo- a movie for like three months, you don't need senior modelers in to previs a movie. It's mm-hmm. it, it sounds horrible, but it's a waste of money to bring them in. Like it's better to bring in a junior. Because they're not, you're not doing super high end critical work. You're doing quite basic stuff, and so you just bring in a bunch of juniors, and then after three months, they'll maybe go somewhere else, or hopefully they'll find stay on to to kind of adapt, to grow in the company. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of where we're at. The one is like a massive catch up. So like if you're a junior or like a starting artist, it's kind of like the perfect time to try and get a job because every company is desperate just for a group of people, and it's not that. It's not to the same level of like scrutiny and in interviews. I mean, obviously, you still need to have good enough skills to get the job, but it's not like you, like, I don't know, like one person or one job that 300 people are applying for. There's like 100 jobs that 200 people are applying for. The odds are just better for you right now. Right. Whereas if you're like a more senior experienced artist, that's not what a lot of companies are looking for really at the moment because it's the catch up stage. Like in four or five months' time, it's going to be brilliant again. But until then, it's kind of like luck of the draw. Um, it's just, it, the, the first like the first half of the year, I was working for a games company because I couldn't get a job in films because they just they weren't looking for the, the, what I was doing. As games was kind of like I don't know, it's in its own little bubble. It didn't seem to be affected by anything, which is which is quite nice. It's a completely different way to work, but I think it's like if you want something more secure, like games is a good way to go. You'll never become well. Okay, that's that might be a bit rude to say, but I don't think you'll ever become like, as good a modeler if you work in games because you're not modeling the same way. You're modeling for efficiency over like you know an uh, un- uncompromising quality. You don't have a render farm. You know, if, if a frame takes nine hours to render, that's not going to work for a game. Right. It's just a completely different mindset. But games is much more secure. So I think that's what a lot of people. Like, that's certainly what I did. Is like it was a nice stopgap. Like. If there's a dip in the market, you can kind of move to games for a bit to keep yourself kind of floating. And then mm-hmm. when it goes back, you can jump back into film. It's Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is fascinating. I'm, I'm really glad to hear your perspective on it and how, you know, what what that what that means and how that implies you know what how people are getting job and that's good that there's a lot of junior positions and it's you know it's oh yeah that but uh but also those junior people turn into senior people right <laughs> yeah Eventually. yeah so uh so yeah you don't want to be a junior person forever so that's the thing right so at some point there's going to be a balance that has to happen because it does kind of have to balance out in terms of yeah. the experience levels that you need um okay well would you call your i mean how what about the technology, specifically in the area that you're focusing on modeling? Like I, I started as as a modeler as well, you know, and then I quickly moved into lighting and then supervising and and other things as well. But, um, but wh- how how what is what's your you know you, you use Lightwave? I know I know the Lightwave crew and the, those 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 that that mentality uh, and the Moto one that translates very easily. Yeah. Uh, well, what's your overall thoughts on? on where modeling is going these days in terms of, you know, hard surface stuff as well as character stuff and all those other things. And for the moment, it's kind of like a, it's like a, it's kind of like a feeling just now like, a, I don't know, like changing of the guards, the right way to put it, but there's definitely starting to get a bit of that stale feeling of like, I learned this old way and I shall not change. It's like, mm-hmm. no, you're going to need to learn how to use Houdini. Like mm-hmm. I think in like a couple of years time, it's just going to be a requirement. Like, no, I want to do it the old fashioned way. It's like, no, you're going to learn Houdini. You're going to do it procedurally if you want a job. <laughs> right. So you think Houdini, is Houdini making an influence in the modeling, uh, in the modeling yeah. world? Really yeah, yeah. interesting. And it's, it's simply just because I think as well, a lot of companies have built like their software 
around that one way of working. I think Modo has started to get some really nice procedural tools in there, but they're still not at Houdini's level because, like, they're like I think Houdini's ethos has always been like a procedural node-based workflow. Mm-hmm. So, like, they've not really had to change and adapt. Whereas, like, for Maya, is not a procedural workflow. I mean, they brought in um, was it Mash? I think there's that new thing they brought in. It's like their procedural engine that's kind of okay, but that's mm-hmm. the point. Is like it's kind of okay. Whereas right. Houdini is already really, really good because that's just their whole thing. That's their specialty. Right. Like I think it's going to be like the safe bet to learn Houdini just now while the other programs catch up because they're going to need to catch up or like it's not going to work for the future. I know, yeah. Like, like, well, what, about, like, what about sculpting, like they, though? Um, I still think ZBrush is the best at the moment. Um. I used to use Mudbox a bit. Uh, now that they've integrated it into Maya itself, I've kind of stopped using it because that's one of the things that really puts me off about Maya versus like other packages. Same, same with like Blender, is there's just so much stuff in one package, and like if it, it's like it's the one thing I've always hated in like with Maya is like if what I would do in Modo or some other program, I'd maybe hit like two shortcut keys and I'm good. If I'm I need to open like a pie menu, then a pie menu, then a drop down, and then a thing, and and then I can't just have my normal shortcuts because I've got the shortcuts for this and animation and effects, and there's just so much stuff in there. I just that I I know it's probably nice from like that point of view of like keeping everything in one ecosystem, mm-hmm. but just for me, it just it feels like cluttered and just too much stuff in one place to make it user friendly. That's why like, I think that's why I just still stick to ZBrush because. It's its own standalone thing. I mean, ZBrush does ev- ZBrush stuff very well. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, for some reason, everything's inverted on Z for no apparent reason. Yeah. Like buttons, things that should be turned on by default are not turned on by default, and you don't find out until you've gone too far into the sculpt and you can't go back. It's, it's certainly got its annoyances, but it's really good at that one task. So that's kind of like my go-to thing on it. Yeah, and is that mainly? You, I mean, that's what you're using mainly for doing uh, for for building your characters, or are you? starting to i mean is houdini actually going to be part of that as well i think at the moment character wise i mean i I don't really play with that side of it um but from what i've been seeing around about the place like for a lot of different companies houdini is mostly coming in for like the simulation and hair side of things Mm -hmm. for character wise it's still sculpt traditional sculpt stuff and uh like the biggest change i've seen that's been an absolute you know it was a groundbreaker it was a, a rap 3d when that started making appearance on the scene, and now it started to pick up traction, it's it's, it's incredible. Uh, it's it's kind of annoying watching. I remember the first time I came across, it, it's like it's the, like what used to take six months to do is like you put like a couple of points on the face, you hit space bar, and like two minutes later, a whole scan is to apologize. Like, ah, okay, there goes my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a thing, right? Do you think that there's things that are like jobs that I mean, honestly speaking, if I never had to UV again, then I would be happy. But oh, yeah. <laughs> but 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 there's still, you know, uh but there's a lot of times where like these tools are starting to get so good that you're like, "Oh, well, that's mainly what I did, but now I don't have to do it anymore." Is that a good thing or <laughs> It's a good thing if you've got the mindset to do it. It's a, a bad thing thing I find it's something that I try and break out of a lot of people so like um it kind of sounds horrible and it is but it works but like I like to go around to like universities and do talks and stuff and I used to get like talks when I was younger and I I, I always kind of hated them because they always were so like sugar-coated and lovely and like oh, everything's rainbows and unicorns like I see the bags under your eyes I don't think there's a lot of rainbows and unicorns going on in your life but, like I like to kind of go around and just like it's like a very harsh reality and you know, everybody's like oh what's if you look at any like online forums like oh what's the best software to use like it's such a nothing question like it, if each got their own little things the software is not what makes you a good artist yeah and it's the same thing like so many people get stuck into it. i've learned this way of doing things and uh, like um the rap three comes along or maybe some amazing um uv thing will come along like oh this is not the way i learned like yeah but you adapt you move into that and then you put your effort somewhere else it's like you can't be you can't be like um like stagnant in vfx like it changes so much like i think that's 
it's like I think it's like you know if you're if you're scared of like that software is taking part of your job away, it just means there's an opportunity for you to go learn something else and adapt. And like as I said, just like I know a lot of what I'm doing is going to go away, so I'm starting to learn Houdini now to get ready for that change. It's, okay. And yeah. then something will come along in ten years' time that will mean I'll have to learn that and get rid of Houdini. Like it constantly is adapting so quickly. You can't mm -hmm. you can't just be stagnant and terrified of change because it's it's not the place to go if you're scared to change VFX. <laughs> No, no. And I think, you know, I know you mentioned earlier with, you know, said you didn't really like how, how Blender works, but at the same time, Blender is having a big influence right now in the, in, as far as I can tell in the, in the market and actually in the modeling side of things as well. Mm. A lot of people really like uh, the modeling tools uh, in Blender. What's your, what is your thoughts about that type of software? Not, you know, the software that's more open source, the software that's a little bit more in that area of things. How do you think that's going to change the industry it's i love the open source side of it it's awesome um i wish that had been around when i was learning um like from a model point of view that would have been a lot better than the way i used to have to go around getting software when i couldn't afford it mm -hmm. you know, like when you're like 15 like for two and a half grand for a license of maya for something that you might use it's like uh, there's other websites I've heard about that can resolve this issue. Right. <laughs> I think from like an integrity point of view, much, much better. Right. But it's also, it's a kind of a horrible side effect that it's having. I'm, I'm really starting to notice on a few kind of social VFX channels that I follow and a few places in general is it's kind of getting this mindset into place like, you know, everything should be free, especially from, I think, from like people who are trying to get work done. I'm seeing a lot of people up like, oh, I need them. Um... Yeah, it used to be you'd maybe get like one person a month would message like, oh, I need this cool project done. Like, I can't pay you, but it'll be good for your portfolio. Right. Like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But now it's becoming kind of like ubiquitous. Like, well, the software is free, so why should I pay you? Like, you know, I just need this done, and it's kind of becoming like an expectation because at least before you could argue, you know, I've got to pay for my software. I can't do this for free, and now it's like that argument's kind of waning. Interesting. And as well, a lot. Of a lot of people are expecting free resources. Like, oh, I need to learn how to do a character. Why should I pay fifty pounds? Like, well, because somebody still had to make all that stuff that you're getting. It didn't magically just appear out of nowhere. Right. But because I got Blender for free, it kind of changes your mindset. Like, I hope that goes. I think that'll go away quite quickly. But at the moment, it seems to be quite like um, it's kind of like poison. It's spreading. But I think it's just because like. Blender's in that point of time when it, it really needs to you know shout loud to get above the crowd of everybody to kind of change the mindset. And I think when studios start adopting it more, it'll be good. Yeah, I mean, you could always yeah. tell a person if he wants it for free. It's like, well, Blender's free. You do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can use the same argument as like, oh, I don't know how to use Blender. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it's the thing as well. It's it's going to depend on what you want to do with your career. Uh -huh. Like for modeling, it. It really doesn't matter what you make it and you put it in an FBX format and everybody's happy. Whereas right. if it's for like groom, like one company has one very specific bit of software they use, like you can't come in and use your own version. Like a lot of the time, like companies have their own custom everything. So even if you are the master of Maya or the master of like V-Ray or Arnold, you'll go in and like they'll have their own version of the software that they've written on top of it. You've got no idea how it works. Mm -hmm. like, like that's it. It's just that general thing of like, don't get stuck in software like if more stuff gets open sourced to a point i quite like the idea of that but obviously at some point in time like somebody needs to get paid it's like you know this I, I like the idea of blender being open source but i still see like like there needs to be something set up to kind of compensate the people who are actually doing the coding maybe like a patreon or some something along that kind of line like um you know if you well, there, if you there use are this plug in. There, there are actually. Uh, uh, there are companies out there that are, you know, Nvidia is actually donating a bunch of money to the Blender Foundation, and so is mm. other companies out there. So, they they are getting paid <laughs> to some yeah. extent. Uh, but it's also, you know, besides besides the idea that Blender is free, that's obviously a, a big uh, thing about oh, yeah. it. But but. Uh, just the idea that it's a tool built by the community for the community as opposed to for stockholders, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. What, what do you think about that? Like, do you think the community actually, what, what, is, what is the, you know, the, is the community actually a, a, a good place to get software done by or? Um, yeah, I, 
if you can if you can filter through a lot of the stuff that you don't need, it can be amazing. Like I've seen uh, as a few blended artists I know, and they'll be using these little plugins that some some guy that they found somewhere in a chat folder made this cool plugin, and it's like the most ma- mind blowing thing I've ever seen in my life. Like wow, that's really really cool. And then I go and try and find something myself, and there's like a thousand plugins. I've got no idea what they do or how they work, or maybe they're not so brilliant. Like I think that's the only downside of that approach. It's like it's less curated. You get a lot right. more variety, but it's a lot harder to find like the really good stuff in there. Yeah, but, yeah. And then also for a pipeline, like MPC, putting Blender into yeah. a pipeline would be a challenge, right? It, it works. For, we've got a few people use it for modeling, but outside of that, it it can't really integrate at the moment. Right. Yeah, I can imagine that the challenges that 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 could have. So, uh, so what? Okay, let's, let's a couple of things I want to want to hit before we, we we go forward. But um, uh, what what is one of the projects? Obviously, I, I love Thor Ragnarok. I love the story you told me about that. But what is any any other projects you want to tell us about that you really are proud of that you've done recently? Um, you've been a couple of films that I've really enjoyed working on, but I've really hated the film. That's kind of a bittersweet one. Not a problem. Um, I have lots of those. <laughs> I would, there's, it's kind of like a, it's like a stupid competition, but um, like when you're, I don't know, I gotta carefully word this without sounding, sounding too narcissistic. Um, like when you're working at like a big, a big studio, you're working on really high end projects. Mm-hmm. You don't have that same thing of like you need to get recognition because like I'm working on the coolest stuff ever. I mean, we're working on like Avengers and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. there's really not too much better you can get. But we've kind of flipped it on its head, and we've got this stupid competition to see who can work on a film that has the lowest Rotten Tomato score mm-hmm. <laughs> because it it kind of makes it more interesting. It's like I'm going to work with like the best artists in the world, but who can produce the best bad film? Yeah, it's. Who, what is the, what a, is the best bad film that you've produced? <laughs> at the moment, it's Doctor Doolittle. Ah, <laughs> I think it. I think it's currently at like seventeen percent in Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, uh, that's one, think, of the, one of my. I think I may beat that. I'll have to look it up. But I worked on Stealth. That was a really <sighs> terrible film. Yep. That had really cool VFX in it, though. It's like, awesome. The ships were amazing. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> just, just the film awesome. was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Same thing. Uh, I also worked on the first Ghost Rider uh, that uh, never I never even saw it in theaters. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. So I, I get that. That's a good thing. That's a fun thing. And I did, like I worked on iRobot as well, which was a, the team on iRobot was awesome. And I had a wonderful mm. time. The film itself was okay. Uh, yeah. but, 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 but the team was great. So what is the, what is, you know, what's your feeling about that, right? Is it, What's the best part, most rewarding part of working on a movie? The movie itself that you're working on or the team and the people you work with and, and, uh, and uh, the, the pride that you have of, of that uh, stuff? I'd say very rarely the film itself. I think right. I, I, like, my, my, my all-time favorite modeling I've done was stuff for Wonder Woman 2. Uh-huh. Um, with the way the film ended up getting made because there's like a few rewrites and a few changes. Like The story ended up being pretty naff. Right. Um, and just just because of the way it was put together, that's completely outside of our control. That's down to like the editors, and that's just something you can't do anything about. And there's a lot of like some of my some of my favorite modeling has been completely cut from the film altogether. It's like you just like you, I very rarely ever watch a film and all my work's in there and I'm happy with it because you know the the guy editing it is just like a two second clip. They like, ah oh, we'll just cut that and there's six months of my life gone for no reason. Yep. So it's it's very much the team. Um, that's, I mean, it's because a lot of the time it can be quite a stressful job. Like, it's nice if you're surrounded by people in the same boat, it's nice to just be surrounded by a bunch of people that exactly understand what you're up to, the same problem, and you can just decompress. And it's, I think that's the best bit as well. Like, even though I've said I'm in Character Lab, who I don't know really how to make characters, and I don't really work in Maya because I don't understand it, but I have to work in Maya. So it's like there's two things that are like completely going against me, but I can just turn to left or right or behind. And even if it's like a VFX supervisor or somebody else, it really doesn't matter who the person is. If you just, as long as you don't interrupt their lunch, they'll give you an answer to a question. It's right. so nice. It's there's like there's no fear. There's no there's no like separation of levels. Really, it's just you can talk to everyone because like you know at some point in time they were a junior who suffered the same problems. They know how much it sucks. 
Because I think there's a lot of people that are scared. Like, oh, if I ask questions, they'll think I don't know. Like, do you know how many times they ask questions a day as well? Like, they don't know half the stuff they need to do either. It's not just you. Yeah. Like, yeah. I remember, you know, I was, and especially, you're absolutely right. I remember I wanna, it was on day after tomorrow, I'd only been working at the company for a few weeks, and it was my first job in VFX. And I was my boss, and he said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. I forgot what he would actually said. And I said, yeah. and I and I was terrified. But I was brave enough to say, I don't know how to do that. And he yeah. looked at me and goes, well, neither do I. But I think between the <laughs> two of us, we can figure it out. <laughs> and I realized I, like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, the, 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 there is a thing, right? That's the thing about what we do is our job as visual effects is to build things that have never been seen before, uh, never been yeah. done before. So by default, what we're doing is always going to be uh, something okay. that's, uh, you know, that's never been done. <laughs> 90% of the job is just backing up your claims. Like right. 10% is, no, is knowledgeable work and the other 90% is like, how do I do this? How do I do this? <laughs> yeah. Yep, for sure. For sure. So that's that's really cool. So obviously, you know, you mentioned uh, that you're getting into uh, uh, getting into character work now and all that stuff. What is what is it you want to do? What, like, where do, you, where do you want to be like in 10 years or 20 years? Do you know or are you just having a great time right now? <laughs> Pretty much is a great time. Um, I'm at a kind of like a, a weird bit that I'm trying to figure out where to go because I've always stuck to mostly just the modeling side of things because uh, my, my color vision is awful, which mm -hmm. is just an amazing thing to have as a VFX artist. So like with like hard surface modeling and stuff, you can get away with that a lot more. Um, and if I'm making spaceships, I can literally just color drop from an image, put it in, done. Because I like there's there's a, there's a lot less subtlety to it. So mm -hmm. like I really want to learn how to make characters, but I've never come across a company where you just specialize in only making like a gray character. There's always going to be some aspect of like colored or subsurface. There's a lot of subtle stuff in there that I just can never see. So mm -hmm. like it's kind of like a weird one. Like I really want to learn how to do it, but I know that I at the moment or unless some cool tool comes along, like I physically can't do it. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like an interesting one. Um there's a, there's a lot of ways to work around it, but again, it's always a workaround. It's never like a full on solution. And for like for like a high end VFX film, like a workaround character face is never never gonna never gonna play ball. Yeah, I actually did know a compositor. He was a very good senior compositor. It was colorblind, and mm -hmm. uh, he would just look at numbers. <laughs> yeah, the hex because, codes really yeah. really help. Mm -hmm. But so that's, that's where it gets difficult with a character. If I'm shining a light through an ear and it's been refracted to the subsurface right. scattering, there's no hex code in there that I can read. It's no, this weird, and I don't know if it's is it the skin, is it the light, what the hell's affecting this thing. Right. But that's kind of my hope at the moment is to start learning characters and like Houdini and stuff. Mm -hmm. And because, what well, I was saying earlier, you, know, you can't be scared of software change. I'm hoping that because hard surface is going to become much more procedural, that that job I was saying that like there's not really a job just now just for the guy who just models the face without the color and stuff. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist right now because it doesn't really need to. But mm -hmm. as all, all the hard surface goes away and becomes procedural, I'm hoping that those kind of jobs start to become a thing because there's going to be much more need for character artists than hard surface artists. So hopefully more positions will become available. They'll change up the way they do it. That's kind of my hope. If that plan doesn't work out. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> right. right, right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. That's super interesting. Well, that's cool. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, you know you'll, 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 you'll. It's, I'm sure at some point you'll get into lighting and you'll try to figure out a little bit about that. It's, it's. Fun. I, 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 have, I have been quite enjoying the rendering side of things because um, that's how I ended up uh, getting into the B ray side of it. Just doing a talk and right. um, as a talk for Modo was doing. And then ended up bumping into your your, your V Ray chap, and he's like, yeah. "Would you like to try it for a few months? Like, you're offering me free software for a few months? Like, yes, <laughs> yeah, of course." <laughs> and I really enjoyed it, but the only thing I found was like, without assets to work on, it ended up slowing me down more because I couldn't just like you know crack open the renderer and start making cool stuff. Like, I need some stuff to work on. Right, like I had to mix models and stuff, texture. It. So it's it was quite fun to play that way, but. I know uh, I know you're into lighting yourself, but I'm 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 all about just chucking in an HDR and calling it a day. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I actually think you know when 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 image based lighting came around, it just made it much easier for sure. Yeah, for sure. 
sure. But uh, but yeah, it's 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 cool. Well, listen, uh, it's it's been it's been a blast talking to you. Uh, you know, it's 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 a shame that we can't do things in person. If we had, you know, I would you know be coming to Vertex and we'd be hanging out at a pub and, and chatting. Oh yeah, and then doing all that stuff. But we can't do that. But it's nice to be able to at least connect this way. Uh, and mm. to have you on the podcast, and it's really great to hear about you know your your thoughts on the world of modeling in 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 the film industry right now because uh, that's that's cool. Uh, you know there there are changes that are happening in the industry, and hearing it from your side is 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 good to hear that. Also, including mm. the fact that just junior positions available, people are probably pretty excited about that. So oh do yeah, that. I think in like the last two weeks we've had like six new people start. Yeah. Uh, most of them are juniors and just like they're coming in thick and fast so like yeah it's like, even if like you're still at uni as soon as they're taking that like quick deep dive in you've probably got like a three-month contract like try it out you'll find out if it's what you want to do or not very quickly <laughs> yeah absolutely and you can well, pay cool. for three months yeah exactly exactly <laughs> exactly well listen thank you so much for doing this Rue. i appreciate it this is a lot of fun awesome